Hi folks, welcome back. Today I want to take a look at a paper back from 1995 that goes into the design of the Java bytecode instruction set. It was written by James Gosling, who is widely regarded to be the creator of Java. And to me, this is an interesting topic because we all know that Java is a very popular language, but the ecosystem of Java includes languages like Kotlin and Scala and Groovy, and all of these languages are able to interoperate because they all run on top of the Java virtual machine, and they all share the JVM instruction set. And that's what I really want to look at today. What you have to remember about the history of the Java project is that it started as a project to run software on very limited embedded devices. So these were devices with very little CPU power, very small amounts of RAM. And you will see how those constraints influenced the design of the instruction set. The idea was that all these various embedded systems would be interconnected with a network and you should be able to ship code to them regardless of what physical CPU architecture they happened to have. And thus, portability was a very important consideration. And this obviously leads to having some sort of an architecture-independent instruction set. The Pascal system from University of California at San Diego was, I think, the earliest system that popularize the idea of having a bytecode instruction set that was architecture independent and portable. There are three major design contributions that the JVM instruction set brings to the table. The first one is the inclusion of type information in the instruction set itself. It was a stack-based instruction set and it had some restrictions on the way the stack could be used. And thirdly, it used symbolic references rather than hard-coded offsets, as with code that is compiled to assembly language for a specific architecture. So let's look at an example of high-level code and how it compiles into JVM bytecode. We have a simple code fragment here that sums all the integer elements of an array. And here we see the bytecode that it compiles to. Load instructions are used to push a value onto the stack. Here we see a load instruction that pushes a pointer to the array onto the stack. Here we see another load instruction that pushes a value of i, the loop counter, onto the stack. Note the difference in the prefix. We have a load for the pointer and i load for the integer. So we see that the instruction itself is encoding the type of the object that it is pushing onto the stack. Here we see the i add instruction where the prefix i means that it's taking integers from the top of the stack and adding them. The important thing to note is that if you look at the sequence of bytecode instructions with their typed prefixes, you can infer the types of the values that are on the stack at any given point in the execution. They call this the type state. And the thing that the JVM requires is that if you look at any point in the execution of a sequence of bytecodes, all code paths leading to that point must result in exactly the same type state. So if you could reach a point via, say, two code paths, the types of the values on the stack at that point should be exactly the same no matter which code path you took. This is exactly the property that bytecode verification checks before a JVM executes a class file. The verifier is the last stage after loading bytecodes and before executing them. It essentially statically or symbolically executes bytecodes to get at the type state of the stack at every point and ensures that it is the same via all code paths. And by the time you've successfully verified bytecode, you know that a number of important properties hold. There are no stack underflows or overflows. You know that all instructions are guaranteed to have the correctly typed values on the stack to operate upon. And you also know that object field accesses respect their private and public modifiers. 
And now that you know these things, the actual execution of the bytecode can become much faster because you don't have to check these properties at runtime anymore. There's another very powerful consequence of having verified the bytecode in this way. With all this type information, it becomes very easy to convert this bytecode into efficient native machine code for the specific machine architecture that it is running on. You don't have to do any runtime type checks because the verifier has already checked that. To take a simple example, if you have an I add bytecode, which adds two integers from the top of the stack, you can translate that on say an Intel architecture to an add instruction with three registers. Now, one of the most common critiques of a portable instruction set is that its performance is going to be worse than that of native machine code. And Gosling takes some time in this paper to talk about that issue. What he's saying is that even if you look at physical implementations of an architecture, as they go from one generation to the next, there are vast differences in the performance of exactly the same code. So you do need to re-optimize your code with every new major revision of a chip's architecture. And with something like x86, they need to carry the baggage of backward compatibility going back decades. That adds a lot of complexity to the chip. Now what Gosling is claiming that if you designed a CPU to be neat and clean without any baggage of supporting backwards compatibility. And on top of that, you had a good code generator that took a portable bytecode instruction set and compiled it to your native machine language. You could actually get net better performance than if you compiled straight to machine language. But he realizes that this conjecture is essentially untestable in the world as we know it today because nobody is going to manufacture a CPU like that. Gosling has some very high level simple benchmarks with a simple loop running over a million times. When it's just purely interpreted, it takes about a second. If you pass it through the on the fly machine code compiler, it comes down by a factor of 10 which the author here claims is as good as native C compiled code. So to conclude, the JVM instruction set is built on the principle of adding simple type information to a stack based instruction architecture. Because it is stack based, the overall programs are very compact. Because of the embedded type information, they can be interpreted very fast but also you can generate very fast native machine code from them on the fly. And the implementations of these interpreters and compilers themselves can also be fast and small and simple. So that was a quick look at the architecture of the Java bytecode instruction set. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.